This conference is brought to you by Callstack, your React and React Native development experts. I'm Anisha, and I'm a senior developer advocate at Amazon, where I help React Native developers build for our Fire devices. But today, I'm here to talk to you about something completely different, the generations of React. Let me start by asking, how many of you recognize this sound? Raise your hands. OK. What about this guy? Yeah, the hashtag OGAI, really. OK, what about this code? Again, just raise your hands for me. OK, a fair amount of people recognize this code. Now, while the first two were just to get us in the mood for nostalgia, if this code doesn't look familiar, it probably means you learned React post-2020. And that makes you part of what I like to call the hooks generation. If you did recognize it, you're part of what I like to call the class component generation. Let me explain. During COVID, I was a tech lead for a project. And as you can imagine, that meant a lot of code reviews. I noticed something. And that's why I used to leave PR reviews like this, because certain patterns kept showing up. Not bugs exactly, but just the junior developers on my team were making choices maybe I wouldn't have. They were reaching for different libraries, structuring components slightly differently. At first, I was like, is this just us like, adjusting to remote working? Or maybe I've become that senior developer who's complaining about the kids these days. But the thing is, it wasn't just the younger developers. It, it was the senior engineers that had switched from Angular. It was experienced backend engineers picking up React for the first time. And they all had one thing in common, and that was that they learned React post 2020. And that's why it makes sense, because in 2020, React shifted from class components to functional components and hooks. And this wasn't just a syntax change. It was a completely different mental model for how we build React which meant how the hooks generation learned React is fundamentally different from how the class component generation learned React. And these are all terms I've just made up, so you won't really find this anywhere. <laughs> but the thing is, how you first learn React shapes how you code and the bugs that you make. So what were those differences that I noticed, and what can you be mindful of when you're writing code? The first and most significant difference was that the hooks generation didn't seem to know about the component lifecycle. As the class component generation, we had to understand the component lifecycle methods. Component did mount, component did update, and component will amount. And these gave clear entry points for initializing, updating, and cleaning up side effects by making it explicit. This runs on first render, this runs on update, and this runs on cleanup. Now, hooks abstracted that all away. But the thing is, the lifecycle still exists. So if you're part of the hooks generation, what, what can you do? It's not like you're going to go back and learn class components just because of this lightning talk. Well, the first thing you can do is understand the mapping between the lifecycle methods and hooks. For example, how the use effect, like the first one runs on render, the second on update, and the third on cleanup. Because when you understand that mental model, that will help you understand when or why something renders. And that makes everything more predictable. Now, there was also a second side effect of not learning the life cycle. And that was that the hooks generation kind of vibed a little bit too much with hooks. If something renders, let's just wrap it in a use memo. Breathe, let's just put a use effect. With class components, there were explicit barriers. You couldn't just throw that logic anywhere. You had to choose. If you want to fetch data, it went in the component did mount for initial load. If you wanted optimization, there was literally a method that asked, should the component update? And you had to decide whether or not you wanted to trigger updates. Now with hooks, that structure, again, is a little bit gone. Because as we saw with the use effect, it can be the component did mount, component did update, and component will unmount all in one. And yes, it's more powerful, but it's also a little bit easier to misuse. And the thing is, use effect is called use effect because it's a side effect, right? It's like I'm saying I want to do something outside of React's normal flow. And that means it should be an exception, not the default solution. So again, what, what can we do, right? Well, the, we can make sure we use our hooks intentionally. And there's a really, really great talk that I, I always refer to, which is by David called Use, Using Use Effect Effectively. Um, there's a great article by Ken Dodds on how to use memo and use callback. 
But most importantly, the new React docs actually recognized this problem. They rewrote the documentation because the old docs did assume that you were coming from the class components. And now it has some really great sections on, you know, you might not need a use effect and the rules of hooks. So take a look at all these resources. Finally, prior to hooks, integrating Redux into a React app or a React Native app was a pain. You needed to understand the entire Flux architecture, create about four files, write three imports, and maybe say a small prayer. And that was just to talk about something. So even though with hooks, the process of integrating Redux, or rather now Redux Toolkit, has become much easier, I feel like those scars of serve as a reminder of the complexities, making the class component generation maybe a little bit less likely to reach for those libraries. So again, my advice, start local. Start with React's built-in state, and then graduate to libraries when you feel the pain. And when you do, make sure you pick the right library. We no longer just have Redux. We have about seven or eight, and I know I should add legend state here, sorry, Jay. Um, but pick the right library for the job. Jotai, for example, is great for component-centric apps. Valtu is great for data-centric apps. And I know in this example, I've picked state management libraries. But picking the right library for the job should apply to everything you do in React and React Native. Like that could apply to lists for whatever you're using your library for. So anyway, for the last probably six minutes, um, you've probably been wondering, cool story, bro. Like, why does any of this really even matter? Like, COVID was just ages ago. Well, the thing is, we now have a third generation of people learning React for the first time. The, I should have really used the pun Gen AI instead of AI generation, but oh well. Um, and the thing is, it doesn't actually matter what generation you're from. With AI now, it is even easier to write code without actually understanding those fundamentals. And if you're like me, you have to deal with a range of devices. I don't know how many of you have ever written an app for a fire stick. Another maybe raise of hands. OK, one, two, three people. Great. <laughs> so Fire Sticks have one GB of RAM. So all of those differences that I noticed, they become a lot more apparent when you have one GB of RAM. So they also become more apparent when you're testing on 10 different devices, and you don't know which use effect is causing your memory leak, or when you expect the compiler to fix all your performance problems, or when that library Mr. GPT told you to use adds extra kilobytes to your app's load time. Everything is more noticeable. So what can you do? Know the fundamentals, and that makes you irreplaceable. We won't look like this. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.